Hey, how you going? Phil Tarrant, uh, co-host of Inside Commercial Property. Hope you're well in the studio, a very hot studio. It's uh, it's full of people today and uh, there are, I know people that work in property, they're normally wearing flashy suits. If you get too close to the flame, they'll start sparking. Uh, it's that warm in here right now. I've got a couple of agents in the studio joining us. We're going to get to them in a moment, but joining me, Scott O'Neill, Director of Rethink Investing. Scott, how, how are you, mate? You well? Yeah, very good. Very good. Looking forward to this one. Got a couple of the uh, big guns of the commercial world here just we, to we do. give us a bit yeah. of a roundup. And I'm happy to, to, to note they are, they are from Queensland, so they're not wearing suits and uh, they are comfortably attired. I imagine they probably had to get out of their shorts, though, for uh, the big trip down to the big smoke. But um, uh, what we thought we would do is actually get the ground truth of some agents uh, acting and operating in particular areas where Scott and his team are actively uh, acquiring property uh, with an eye of what's happening today, but an eye towards the future. So trying to understand how they think, how they, what makes them tick, uh, how to best deal with them, how to get the, create the best relationship with them. Uh, if you're a commercial investor and Scott, you do a fair bit of buying up in Queensland, if I'm right. Yeah. So we're, we've purchased oh, probably, it, it wouldn't be far off 1500 deals in Queensland. So uh, high volumes for many years. And um, yeah, look, these these markets are some we've bought 70% of the properties in. Um, so very high, I guess, market share as well. And uh, yeah, we buy there because we like the growth stories. We like the yields. That was, you know, kind of day one, what it got us there. And then the more you find out, you go, all right, there's actually upside in the the rents and uh, and they, they performed really well through COVID. So, you know, kind of doubled down after that because we mm. just saw how, how stable things were when other parts of the country were going backwards. And uh, yeah, it's been a really good patch for us. And it's a market that I think has a good 10 years ahead of it too. Like we'll go down to Queen, Queensland in general. Yeah. 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 And there's some markets which are better than <laughs> others, but um, yeah, there's no one really out there saying it's got a bad long-term picture. Yeah. Well, I think we've spoken about it at length on this podcast. We cover a lot on, on Smart Property Investment. You're tuning into this on the Property Investment Podcast Network, where we've talked about the dynamics of the Queensland market, both from a um, economic development point of view, a lot of the infrastructure stuff in the pipeline, uh, this intrastate migration, a lot of uh, people from the south, southern uh, states, um, um, New South Wales and Victoria in particular, have decided to call Queensland home. Uh, and we all know that commercial property is inherently connected with with people, the economic activities that they uh, uh, engage with and the products that they consume. So there's a good reason why um, Queensland should be able to um, uh, surge forward as a, a commercial property a location. But we've got two people in the studio. And if you're tuning into this, uh, wherever you're tuning into it right now, I know we see a lot of you on your your social media. Uh, you can watch this full video. It's all over YouTube and all over the place. So I have a one-page uh, brief on this and I've just scribbled a couple of notes on it and I've just because I reckon I'm probably going to get these two places wrong and the wrong person connected with it so I do apologize uh, in advance chance but um, I, I can be forgiven because the two key markets that we're going to talk about today uh, are both in Queensland one is Toowoomba and the other one is Townsville now Toowoomba is about 120 kilometers from uh, Brisbane and Townsville get ready for it, is 1,400 kilometres from Brisbane. So we're talking about the same state, right? It's it's a big place, Queensland. Brisbane is closer to Melbourne than what Brisbane is to Cairns, to give some sense for it. So um, for these people who talk about collective states, you'd be forgiven to thinking they're all the same. We're talking about two places a long, long, long way away. Now, um, uh, having a shout around Toowoomba, we could probably cover uh, areas of the Sunshine Coast and then covering areas of um, Townsville, we can also cover some areas like Mackay and stuff. So uh, our two agents, these guys are both guns, are from Colliers, which is a good outfit operating in Queensland also nationally. Um, uh, it'd be a real estate brand a lot of you will be familiar with, typically uh, connected in with uh, industrial markets and, and commercial markets more so than Resi, but the nature of some of these markets that these gents operate within means they also touch a bit of Resi as well. And they also touch some other areas. So uh, hailing from Toowoomba, is uh, Dan Dewan? Do I get that right? Dewan. Dewan. Close. Dewan. Dewan. See, Swan weather day. But this is a um, it's my Queensland accent, right? Yeah, you know, it's, it's you. the inflection points. And Sean McLean, I got that right. McLaren. Yeah. McLaren. It's a God. like the racing car. I say. See, how could I get that so wrong? Yeah. It's deliberate though, just to yeah, uh, yeah, help no, you no, guys settle you. in. Extra point. Uh, to it all. Now, the the quick question I've got is that you guys work a lot with uh, Scott O'Neill um, uh, through uh, real estate transactions. Is he easy to deal with? He is. He is. 
uh, yeah, I think um, it's probably started our relationship with Scott started a few years ago. We were talking about it today, but just essentially we find Rethink to be a pretty good company to deal with in terms of the clients that are associated with them. They seem to be more educated than the average commercial uh, investor. So it just makes the process a little bit smoother and um, quite an enjoyable experience. So, and they're able to be, they were able to hold their hand and uh, assist the clients really well through due diligence periods and different things like that. So there seems to be a bit of education that are done with the clients. So it makes the process, yeah, pretty smooth transaction generally. So it's good. That's yeah. good for you guys as well, agents, right? It, it makes it so much easier when you're dealing with people who know what they're talking about. Mm. Um, the little intricacies around buying commercial property, dealing with credible, capable people just makes the whole process so much easier. It's like, and I don't know if you've spoken about this before, it's about you know, like the right solicitor involved mm. makes a big difference. The mm. same with the buyer's agent sort of things. And you know, there's lots of buyer agent groups out there. You know, some are good, some are bad. You know, we, we enjoy spending time you know, and, and obviously transacting properties with Rethink because they know what they're doing. Mm. Um, they've got a good level of credibility and that's what it's easier for us to put deals together when we're dealing with somebody who knows what they're talking to. There's a lot of people tuning to this uh, podcast, gents, who um, who listen to it because they get all this information and they go about doing it themselves, which is cool. I think yeah. it's great. Yeah. You know, the, the better that we can empower um, property investors, commercial property investors, to make better transactions, I think is is good for the sector, is good for the industry, it's good for investors themselves. But they might not like hearing this. But do you think that? Investors that use buyers agents get an advantage that direct people don't because of that knowledge, that connectivity. Look, I think there's um, dealing with people like Scott and Rethink. They know their markets they're dealing in. They've done their research. You know, they're, they're going to come into things well informed. And actually, certainly, as Sean said it before, the due diligence process it's it's extensive. So, mm. you know, I think that should give people confidence knowing that you know, the lots of the people they're dealing with. You know, the deals that are presented. You know, a, a credible you know, deals that you know make sense and i spoke to scott about this earlier when we caught up um the other thing that we're pretty cautious about is if we've got a buyer's agent who's doing a really good job in our market they've got buyers that are active they're transacting on properties well for that reason we're not going to put in front of them an investment that we wouldn't recommend highly and that we're not confident about so there's no point in us trying to put something in front of scott or rethink that we're oh geez it's a bit dodgy you know is it you know is it something that we should sell or not but we're pretty confident in all the deals that we put in front of him because we know that it's a good relationship we want to look after them make sure that they're um they're happy clients and and scott keeps coming back to townsville or so, Toowoomba. so yeah so so, he's, so you're saying there's actual genuine equity in the relationship where you're you're, oh, you're so, only going to put good deals in front of scott because you know well, that well we know very well that you know scott and his team have done their work on the, the clients they're presenting to you around their capability to perform hmm. and that's half of our job as agents is, is assessing you know the buyer you know as far as their capability actually to complete a contract to perform hmm. so there's no point in us going down a long journey and some of those you know obviously you know due diligence processes can be long and extensive and you know from our point of view you've got to back the right buyer to make sure a deal transacts too so yeah you know, that's that's the comfortable part with with dealing with credible people um to make sure deals come together and, and that goes back to the point of of um there being an advantage using a buyer's agent because you know scott's putting people up that oh definitely that essentially mm -hmm. the, the hard work's been done in triaging whether or not this is a real deal buyer yeah. that you'll invest more time and energy and effort to get a deal done look i think a big part of getting a, a transaction across the line is a lot of you know education and comfort and knowing the ins and outs and, and we touched on this before and, and, and off air around people's lack of knowledge around commercial property and this has been a great podcast for people to be educated in that space but you know you know you're dealing with someone who's actually been through a process and has a greater level of certainty and comfort around being able to complete as opposed to someone who's less educated uh, and it sort of starts to bring some nervousness into the transaction. And, you know, we've both, I'm sure Sean's the same, we've, we've gone through transactions where you think this is a done deal and through nervousness or, you know, minor things at the end of the day, a deal doesn't get done. And you, know, you, could, be, you could be 60 days or 90 days down the track too. Mm. So then you've got the other thing that you've got to factor in is the, the owner of that um, property. You've got to factor in them and the outcome that they want. And if you, you know, you're three months down the track and you've got a deal that's, kaput and it's at an end you've got to start the whole process again so and, and that's tough and and you know we do need to reinforce that that you gentlemen the agent works on behalf of the vendor you, know, you want to get the absolute 
depending, but you want to get the best price possible. But there's other things vendors may need. They might need to move quickly or they might need to donate settlements, or, which is all negotiable. But if you, you need to make the decision to invest in a particular party to proceed on putting a deal together to get a transaction done, if you choose the wrong party, that means it's compromising your ability to get the vendor the satisfaction out of what they want from it, and that compromises your ability of an agent. So Definitely. it comes back to the point, you, you want to invest time, energy, and effort in the deals that get done. Mm -hmm. And if it's been largely um, um, triaged properly by the fact that you've got a buyer's agent act, acting and operating in it, it means that deals happen faster, um, which typically make people yeah. happier, and you can get to a conclusion quicker, quicker, which removes a lot of stress around it. Yeah, definitely. And, that's, that's, and as a buyer's agent, one of the things that's helped our growth over the years is whenever I put an offer to guys like this, it's got to have a real buyer behind it because there's so many others that go out there and just put offers in to take it off the market. So you generally have someone that wants to buy. It's not just fishing. Yeah, I have yeah. to. Otherwise, I, I'd feel like I'm just going to let them down. Imagine I've put an offer down. They get accepted by their vendor. Like it's going to be an offer that they've had to work at too. Imagine they're not completing on that. All of a sudden, they're going to think we're a fake. We've got no real buyers behind it. And it's that ability to connect. And um, it's the hardest thing in that game, like to actually bring the buyer and the seller together or we'll get them mm. the listings, the hardest thing. But um, yeah, the qualified buyer is, is the key that I think we've got over others because there's lots of buyers agents out there. But how many have multiple buyers at price points that can sort of back up even if the first guy falls over? And um, we need to get good deals to, to represent that. But um, and that's where the relationship goes both ways. We want to make sure our buyers are strong. Um, we want, we're want we going to represent the buyer. We're not here to get a good price for the vendor. But um, if we allow the, our buyer into a deal at the right money, um, unless something goes wrong, which only them will exit the deal, like a bad building report or maybe the tenant's failing or something, we'll mm -hmm. get out. But uh, we shouldn't be crashing otherwise. Yeah. And it goes back to the, to the actual agent. I sort of learned this sort of knocking around the souks of the Middle East for many years. Um, if you're going to buy something, you're going to put a, an offer in for something, you've got to be ready to back that up with a sale. Because yeah. if you say, if, if someone agrees on a price and all the conditions, you go, no, nah, I don't want to buy anything. Well, mate, you'll be chased out with yeah. machetes, right? Yeah. Um, uh, the same thing applies to property. Exactly. Putting in just, 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 um, uh, putting in offers for stuff that you don't have a genuine buy behind, yep. you know, you, you you will ruin your reputation immediately and you'll be washed out of the market. And, and agents, agents aren't, um, uh, you know, they, they, they could be tough people uh, to deal with sometimes, and that's the nature of the job. But if you can create trust and respect with an agent, the terms really become negotiable. You can lose your reputation pretty quickly with an agent. You'll just get completely whitewashed. Well, yeah. So it that won't deal with this yeah. person. Yeah. We spoke place. about this off air again. But um, same thing, Townsville and Toowoomba markets are not massive. They're not huge. So you've got to be confident that whoever you're dealing with, they've got the ability to perform and to, you know, to see out a contract. Because if you don't, you're going to have reputational damage with the vendor, um, with tenants involved and all that sort of thing. And you don't want to have that stress um, and go through that. So we prefer, and in a perfect world, we want to only deal with informed buyers, educated buyers that know what they're after. If we can do that, it's a smooth transaction for everyone, yeah. owners included. And, and you know, when, when I sort of compare markets, Sydney or Melbourne, for example, or Brisbane, Townsville and uh, Toowoomba are smaller markets. Toowoomba would be bigger than... Than Townsville, but um, you know you need you need to eyeball your next clients at the local RSL, the pub, or the coffee shop where you see them every day. It's where you work. Yeah. It's, your, it's where you work. It's your reputation, yeah. um, you know. And and you know, trying to put a deal together with the wrong buyer can erode that so quickly. So I guess the point is, go and do this stuff yourself. Um, um, uh, you don't need to be using a buyer's agent for buying commercial property, but there is advantages uh, from it and that sort of connectivity. Would you ever get properties that? never see the open market because you know Scott is there and he's got clients ready to go or some other buyer's agent has clients ready to go. Do you always take, I'm just thinking tactically, do you always take stuff to market or depending on what the vendor needs, you'll move quickly and just go direct to a buyer's agent? I think there's a lot of deals in both residential and commercial that are done off market, not in Townsville, Toowoomba, in every market. Mm. Um, and I think if you've got a vendor or a uh, an owner that you know wants to transact and you want to know he wants to transact at a certain price, because of the deals that you've done over the years, you'll know, well, actually, there's six buyers already that I know that would, that would move on this particular asset. So there are a lot of off-market deals done. There's an advantage in terms of marketing costs that are saved, time on market and all that sort of thing. And as long as that owner knows that that outcome is the best outcome that they can get, 
then they're, they're happy to do off market deals. It's a it's a pretty regular occurrence. Yeah, look, it is pretty frequently. And look, I think there's it's it's probably a trust factor as well. Mm-hmm. You know, it's obviously not not every deal's the same. And you know, obviously, as you said before, our, our job is to get the best deal for our sellers. Um, now. Sometimes that's on market and it depends on the type of asset, but it obviously depends on their motivation as well. So it's, you know, I suppose it's a trust factor from the point of view, they're relying on people like Sean and myself to, mm-hmm. to give them the right advice, you know, around market value, you know, and if there's an opportunity off market, which might be, you know, a comparable outcome for them, you know, then it's up to us obviously to give them that advice that, you know, we think that's a, a good way to go. But look, a lot of the time, it's it's their discretion, it's their motivation. It depends on which way they want to go. And a good agent will give the vendor those options because, you know, we obviously talk a lot about buying property, but the other side of the equation for commercial property is selling property, right? Mm -hmm. There's a point in time where you want to realise the value in your assets. So it's where a really good agent can can work with you tactically to understand what your drivers are. Okay, do you want to do a quick deal? Do you want to do a – do you want to be anonymous? Do you want to keep it out of the records? Do you want to create market tension? All this sort of stuff. We um, we were chatting about this before too. The other thing that – you know, from an agent's point of view, both Dan and I have been in it long term. Dan's a lot more experienced than I am, but I've been doing it for 12 years. Dan, I think, has been involved with Collies for 14 years. We're not here to fly by night just to do as many deals as we can in 12 months and never be seen again. When you're dealing in a market in Townsville or Toowoomba, you've got to do the right thing with the vendors, with the buyers in those markets because if you don't, you'll be found out pretty quickly and and you're not going to have any longevity in the game. And if you want to have longevity, you've got to deal, you've got to do the right thing by your vendor, you've got to do the right thing by the buyers and it'll, uh, you'll be well looked after in that industry. So. See, a big thing is too, and this is getting a little bit ahead of the game, but you know, a lot of the time we like to be involved in the property post settlement. So from a management point of view and ongoing. So, you know, that's where it sort of comes back to making sure, you know, what's been presented is accurate, you know, and, you know, when a deal's been presented, it's actually something that's good commercial yeah. deal that makes sense. Because mm. it might, you know, down the track, I mean, the last thing you want to get into is, you know, a rent negotiation with a renewal that, you know, rents are dropping or, you know, markets change. So That's a good point. So at what percentage of um, managements would you get acting on behalf of the buyer once they've acquired an asset? Oh, look, it varies. It, mm. re- it really does. I mean, it depends on, you know, geographically where they're located. I mean, we were talking about this before. Some people like to be able to drive past, touch and see an asset, mm. be actively hands-on involved. There's other people who, you know, are purely there for the dollars and cents part of the transaction and, you know, happy just to see the money hit the tin, you know, once a month and, yeah. you know, leave the, the day-to-day, you know, ongoing you know, involvement of an asset to someone else. So, But, but the point being that if you, if you market and sell an asset on one basis and that person chooses to use you to manage the property, yep. it's got to stack up, right? Well, same exactly. one of the same. Yeah. yeah, one of the same. Yeah. It's, yeah, there is a thousand ways we can take this particular podcast, Scott, and and, and thanks for for bringing Dan and and Sean and having a chat about this because yeah, you, know, you often understand the psyche and and the way in which resi agents work, but commercial guys are a bit of an enigma. You know, they yeah. they, they typically <laughs> well, you know they're, they're not as flashy as as the residential guys. How do you guys find colleagues? You've been with it a long time. You must be a good outfit to be part of. Oh, look, it's a great, credible brand. Mm. You know, we're, uh, 14 years I've had with Collier's uh, next month, um, you know, as far as a, a partner office with Collier's. So, look, it's, you know, it's it's one of the biggest commercial agencies, you know, nationally, well, internationally. So, I mean, it's yeah. uh, that brings credibility with with what we do on a day-to-day basis. It gives our, our buyers and sellers confidence, you know, knowing that the, the credibility of the brand they're dealing with. And certainly it's an advantage for us in the market, for sure. Mm. Yeah, and I'd say the same thing. I've been with Collier's. I don't know anything else, but I've been with them 12 years and I find that, yeah. My boss would like me saying this, but I think they're the most, they're the best agency in every area where they're based. You know, I would say that we're the best agency in Townsville and, um, you know, we have the most experienced agents and it's always been good to deal with. You know, we always have good support from colleagues and it's a pretty good organisation to work for. What's the competitive uh, relationship like with 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 people up there, you're putting sort of bananas in each other's exhaust pipes <laughs> to win listings and stuff. It's, it's, it's typically quite collegiate, right? Because you need to understand the market, but but competition fierce in in Toowoomba. Oh, there's, there's, there's always competition, but you yeah. know, on the, on the flip side of things, you've got to be able to work with the other agencies too. Yeah. Yeah. And we we as much as we've you know got majority market share up there, we don't control everything. So I mean, when we see good opportunities come across other people's desks, then we'll we've got clients that we try to look after that. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We, we try and work with you. Do tie ups and what conjunctions, I guess you call it. You yeah, do that sort yeah. Of stuff. we yeah. do that with other agents yeah. as well. There's, uh, yeah, we try and you're better off in a market, like I said, where it's not massive. If you try and work with every agent and have a relationship with the other agents, you're always going to be ahead. So, yeah, we, we see it first, like markets like Brisbane, for example, it's it's 
full on there. You know, like you'll have, we've had in one day, five agencies send the same property to us within the hour. Like it's a race, you know, because like they'll do like an open listing and I don't know, like what, that's one of my biggest frustrations. Why would an owner go to five different agencies? I don't even know how they what, do that. Everyone gets a listing and then they've got to shop yeah. it around. That's... And then they know we'll buy it if it's a specific yield and that. So, and then I play this rule, whoever sends it to me first, I'm not going to play God with people's commissions. It's like whoever comes in first, we'll, we'll honor that. And then they race it to you. So it all just like, you know, went one after the other. The, you know, Do you say that XYZ has already sent me this property? Yeah. Because yeah. otherwise, say, um, games can be played. Like some might lie that they've got exclusive agency agreement. I've had that. And then you, you take their word on it. And then you find out that that wasn't true. So then you don't trust that agent again. Like, um, yeah, it's pretty brutal in some markets. Like yeah. um, Townsville's pretty full. And I haven't seen it as much in Toowoomba. Uh, so down, Townsville's pretty competitive, is it? Like, yeah, there's yeah. there's a couple of guys out there that, that go hard. Um, but lot look stock is low across the country. Mm. And in Queensland's no different. So that's the problem. Everyone's kind of fighting over less stock. Because once yeah. the market's kind of cooled down, smart, you know, smart vendors know that, you know, I could probably get more in twelve months' time or or they got nowhere better to put their money is a big problem. So, you know, they there's just less transactions happening. So mm. everyone's fighting harder to get last year's revenue. Ooh. Yeah, that's right. And and if if listens are down, it's inherently subdued. If you're a real estate agent, right? Yeah, you, you make your money off commission. So let's let's talk then. Let, let's do a couple of. Um, so I'm I'm intrigued about how local markets operate. Um, a bit of a wrap up on. We'll kick off with you, Sean, and in, yep. in Townsville. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Townsville, it's about four hours south of Cairns and Port Douglas on the uh, obviously on the coastline of Queensland. Uh, as I said beforehand, 1,400 kilometres from Brisbane, right? So that's not a day trip. That's a long – it's probably just down the road for you blokes, isn't it? Yeah, well, <laughs> oh, I, just I, would say, big smoke, I would say Townsville is geographically located right in the middle of Cairns, Mackay, and, uh, and you know, we got Mount Isa out to the west of us. So it's not so. like an economic centre, right? It's where yeah, so it's the, yeah. it's the unofficial capital of North Queensland. People yeah. will – yeah, from other places might not like me saying that, but it's definitely the capital of North Queensland. Are you born and bred up there? Born and bred in North Queensland, not from Townsville originally, from okay. the Tablelands originally, from up in Atherton. Okay. Place, uh, You're going to have nice to give me geography. How far is that from Townsville? Four hours. Okay. Three and three quarters if you get a good run. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm from there originally, moved to Townsville for uni and um, yeah, sort of found myself in commercial what, property. What did you study? Marketing, business marketing. S business marketing. Yeah. And, and how did you end up being an agent? Oh, we could. the short version is I tried to sell my boss uh, his old man a car. Okay. When I was working at uh, my county Toyota and Lexus of Townsville, and yeah. uh, I did that unsuccessfully, he uh, he bought an Audi instead of a Lexus, but uh, just kept coming back to see me for coffees for a couple of weeks afterwards. And eventually, I was like, "Graham, what's he up to? What are you doing, mate? Like, why do you keep coming back in here? You got an Audi, you don't need a car anymore." But then he said, "Well, you know, my son runs this business, and this is what he does, and you want to have a coffee with him." And I said, "No, oh, well, that sounds good. Monday to Friday." Uh, you know, don't have to work weekends, and um, yeah, he promised me squillions of dollars. So, uh, of course. I so you're working, you're working weekends at the car, trying trying to flog cars, yeah. and now it's gen gentlemen's hours in commercial property Monday yeah. and Friday. Yeah. Uh, duck the water. How'd you find sort of moving into commercial property rather than sort of selling cars? Pretty good. Yeah, yeah pretty good. I enjoyed it. I it was a good thing because I enjoy. I have an interest in property. You know, always yeah. have. You know, I've bought properties young, and um, I enjoy it. Whereas to be truthful in cars, I didn't. I didn't. I don't own a luxury car. That's probably one difference from commercial guys versus resi guys. We don't really care about what sort of car we drive. We don't have to get around in flash Mercedes or anything like that. You sell that so, to all the miners, do you, out there? Mate, we yeah. uh, just drive whatever car we can. And I wasn't passionate about that, yeah. whereas real estate was a lot, uh, yeah, it was just something that I enjoyed a lot more. So, yeah, it was quite, I started in 2000 and uh, 11 mm. it was a pretty tough market the gfc was probably just starting to bite then in townsville we were a bit off the pace for a lot of the metro areas but um it was good grounding you know tell me about your first property you sold first property i sold i probably can't even really remember it but it might have been a block of land at uh 37 silver road which i remember <laughs> transacting for a, remember for a fellow there i think that was one of the early ones and i was pretty happy about it but yeah. um just a little industrial block of land it's got it's probably got about 26 little storage units on it now. Yeah. But Are you happy you landed in the commercial sort of realm rather than resi? Yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I mean, I've probably had opportunities to go in the resi world, but uh, yeah, I don't want to work. I don't want to do open houses on weekends and stuff. I choose to follow my kids around playing 
you know, watching them play games of soccer cool. and footy and stuff instead. So. so what's the spread on commercial properties? What's sort of the cheapest? Just I'm trying to get a sense of, of the Townsville market. I really want to drill down. What's the cheapest properties? What's the most expensive properties? Oh, uh, you'd you'd find that the most uh, affordable properties are probably your owner occupied properties. So like you, someone wants to buy a warehouse for their electrical business or plumbing business, and you can get them entry level properties maybe around that three hundred grand mark. Okay. Um, there's not many of them at the market in the market at the moment, but you know it might be three hundred, four hundred grand, and you know they could go up to millions of dollars really. Okay. So Townsville. Our population's nearly on 200,000 people. Um, as I said before, geographically located in the middle of North Queensland and we're supported by, we've got the biggest hospital in Northern Australia. We've got James Cook University, Central Queensland University. We've got Townsville Port, which is one of the biggest ports in Australia. Um, we've got the biggest defence barrac barracks, um, defence barracks in Australia. So we've got a really good mix of, you know, a diverse economy and that makes for geographically and the diverse economy it makes it quite attractive. Um, and I was sort of saying to Scott before, on the back of COVID, that's made the Townsville market, seems to have put the Townsville market and regional markets up in lights. I think people sort of woke up during COVID and said, why are we living or doing business in these metro areas where we're busting our ass in Melbourne and Sydney trying to get returns or make money when they can go regionally and you know, less competition, better return on their money and you know just a really good investment so we've found that townsville and i think dan would say the same thing about toowoomba people really started looking at regional markets we felt in sort of 2020 2019 maybe that um it started to come more and more on their radar so outside of the sort of mum and dad smes who who own the property that they that they use for the purpose of business like who's most invested in in the local market by way of sort of who are the investors are they out of towners well traditionally we would have local investors so mm. um you know in townsville at the moment i would say that you can sort of get yields between 6.5 and 7.5 percent yeah um and we would have had prior to say 2020 a lot of that would be local people maybe north queensland based investors that have taken up the investment opportunities but i feel like since COVID sort of hit in 2020 a lot of the buyers that we have, we're servicing a lot of buyers that are interested in Townsville from Southeast, you know, whether it be from Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, where they're saying, you know what, we've got money, we've got the ability to invest in product. Why am I doing it down here where it's 5% when I can go up to Townsville and do it at 8%, you yeah. know? And that's that's gradually tightened. We were probably selling deals at 8.5% net a few years ago. And now it's coming down to, you know, might be doing stuff around 6, 6.5, subject to, the lease term, the quality of the tenant, and the location of the asset. But, so, so, uh, so without locals owning the investment properties, that's sort of removing some money out of the local markets because it's going down south into mm. Brizzy, etc. But um, the fact that you're attracting sort of money from outside the area into commercial properties must have had a uh, an inflection point on prices, right? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like originally, we might have been doing deals at eight, eight and a half percent. Yeah, and that's just purely net. because it's just new money's coming in. Yeah, that's because there wasn't as many buyers, maybe, and it was was not as competitive. But um, we've found that the yields have certainly contracted, and and they're sort of you know for the right asset, we can get below six percent. Um, obviously, a little bit higher now. We've spoken about that today as well, mm. where you know with the interest rate rise and all that sort of thing, there's got to be a bit of give on that return. Mm. So they're coming up slowly. But um, yeah, we've definitely found that there's a lot more buyers in the market. And the problem that we have in Townsville right now is we just don't have Can't that stock. investment stock. Yeah, so yeah. we've had a pretty good two or three year period where we've done well with any investment type sales that we've had and we've transacted them on the market through Rethink Investing and, and other organisations as well. There's other buyers out there, there's local buyers. Um, but what we found is that sometimes buyers agents will see better value in a an asset at a certain return more so than local buyers. You know, they'll we might say, hey, look, guys, this is available. It's a five-year lease and it's 7.5% net. We might have some people locally saying, well, I'm not going to pay that for it. Whereas other buyers who might be based in Sydney and Melbourne be like, well, heck, I haven't seen a 7.5% return for years. So yeah. they, they're they straight on it. So yeah. they, they just see – they they see value in our market probably a little bit more than what locals do at the moment. So what's – good stock up there right now is it industrial mainly is where the, the smart money's going look we um we we probably will have uh interest in investment stock across all the different factors whether it be commercial retail industrial um it just comes down to the tenant 
So all those all those investment classes will be of appeal, but it just t- comes down to the quality of the tenant, the length of the lease, where it's located. So we've done a lot in industrial over the years, but we've also got done pretty well in commercial as well. Just subject to, it really just comes down to the type of tenant and who they are and what the lease terms like. So yeah. um, the hardest thing that we have at the moment, and Dan's the same, is just trying to, that stock that we've sold is trying to uh, replenish that stock and get other stock on the market because the, the demand's there. We just don't have the ability at the moment. We just really need to, we either need to build that stock mm. and create sort of, um, you know, tenant interest or we need to try and look at a different approach. And Scott and I spoke about that earlier where maybe it's at the moment where we look at opportunities where there's a vacancy in a particular warehouse and if you can get at the right price point where then you take the risk that with a bit of work and a bit of love and care for that particular property, you can then invest, you know, like get a tenant for it and, and turn and so, it around. So sort of manufacturing dormant stock into yeah. productive stock. What else needs to happen to get vendors to sell? Uh, there's got to be a, a a point where the prices outweigh the um the attractiveness of holding, right? And and but the thing is, that if you're not getting the transactions, you're not going to get the uplift in pricing. So yeah, it's well, a cash flow too. Our market then fluctuates a little bit when mm. sales start to be a little bit harder to get. Then all of a sudden, there's more of a focus on leasing. So then there's that leasing market then becomes more active, and we're doing a lot of industrial leases, commercial leases, retail leases. Um, and then you might go through a period, 12 months, 24 months, where that's your main thing. But then that'll turn around because those leases that you put in place, you know, 12 months or two years earlier, those owners might say, you know what, it's now time for me to sell because I'm changing my personal circumstances. I want mm-hmm. to retire. I want to do this. And those properties come back around. But that's the, that's that whole importance of making sure you maintain a good relationship with the landlord um, because in three years' time, that landlord become, could become a seller so you need to make sure that you look after him with that lease and then hopefully get the product you know get the uh, asset for sale a few years later so how do you know you've done a good job at the end of a a deal how do you sort of go yeah that was a good one i think and how do you celebrate i think you just know through well you if you don't do a good job you normally get feedback yeah you know when you do a poor job you do you generally get feedback on a poor job before you get feedback on a good job normally from the vendor yeah 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 yeah. but i think if you maintain good relationships with a uh with a a buyer or a tenant or even landlord you know that through the fact that they're continually calling you the fact that you're catching up with them socially or Mm. whatever um so in townsville you can see them and you see them all the time different people because it's not a very you know, it's not a massive city. You bump into them at the footy and stuff like that. And you know pretty quickly if they're uh, unhappy with the job that you've done. They'll tell you, so, right? Yeah, yeah. Queensland. Wait, so, wait, culturally, what's it like sort of act, acting and operating up in far north Queensland? You've got to change how you do stuff. Uh, I, I'm sure I can come up with a whole bunch of stereotypes <laughs> about northern Queenslanders, but I'll choose not to at the moment to, for, for you know, the safety of my life. But uh, with, with no different. joke, there's like dealing with commercial agents, yeah. they are professional. Like that's one of the best parts of my job. Like they are not just about marketing themselves, like the residential guys or, you know, it, it's a different vibe because they understand business and they are generally involved in the leasing. And if you are involved in leasing, you understand business because you got to understand the business needs and then find the space for them and then understand the competitive landscape. Like it's pretty complex. So yeah. these guys speak our language. So there's actually no culture divide really like they all have the same accent they all they're very similar to the guys in perth as they are in hobart um some of the sydney office guys can be a little bit of a different breed but they're but they're still um yeah i I guess it's they're all businessmen which is easy yeah and they all want the deal done right they want satisfied stakeholders and in because when you think about a commercial um equation of investors um you don't get well the probably mainly investors rather owner occupied stuff so you've got you've got a vendor you've got the tenant and you've got got the buyer right you've got to keep everyone sweet you got to maintain really good relationships with them and sometimes you know if you don't maintain a good relationship with a tenant then mm-hmm. that's going to cost you it's going to cost you down the track it's going to cost you when you're doing an inspection to sell the property yeah. or you're not even going to get the opportunity to sell just the make your life hard yeah right? because you've made yeah you've upset them so they're pissed off and they'll report that back what to do you the, charge for management up in up in um your neck of the woods Oh, I um I don't get involved too much in the management side of things. Yeah. And again, there's so many variables. It comes down to the value of the asset, how long the lease is, how much management will be involved in that particular yep. one. But I think they probably vary between five to seven percent. 
um, on that sort of percentage. Mm. And uh, it just comes down to how big the asset is, how many tenants are involved in that particular asset as well, and how much management's required. And we've probably gone through a period where we've previously had to knock back management, um, you know, inquiry sometimes because we just, with staff and that, when we went through COVID, there was just, it was really difficult to get staff. Um, and yeah. it's not my staff, but for my boss to him, for him to recruit staff and that. Mm. So we probably went through a period where we couldn't really take on too much in the way of management or we had to be selective about it. Um, but that's really probably turned the corner a little bit now. Yeah. We've got a good crew of, of management, a management team who look after staff and it, we're in a position where we can take on the better management properties yeah. that we sell. Yeah, you, want to, you want to pick and choose, right? Because you want the right stuff. Give me a sense. Have you, have you got any examples of a couple of properties that you might have on the market up there right now in, in Townsville? Like just to give us a, a view or a lens of what to look at. I can give you an example of maybe a couple of recent deals. We don't have yeah. too much in the way of investment stock. Um, on the market, that's part of the problem. That's what we're sort of working towards. A couple but, of recent deals are good. Yeah, so maybe a couple of recent ones that we're involved with Rethink. Um, Scott and I were chatting about this earlier, but we had an 875 square meter building that was leased on a four year lease to an, an Australian national tenant. So um, it was in a good complex or an industrial complex. So it was modern tilt slab, um, well located on the highway in Townsville. Um, that particular complex was built well and that sort of thing. So with a four year lease in place, it was done at a quite a good net rental. So in terms of, I would say that it was under rented. Um, so it had about 75 and a half grand in net rental on a four year lease. That was transacted and purchased at a 6.16% uh, uh, return, which is probably pretty sharp yield. But as I said to Scott and even the value was involved because of the way that that rental was probably below market, it's got a lot of upside to it. And it's just a really strong lease profile with a particular tenant. So yeah. that then sells at sort of 1.225 million, but that's a really good property long term. If there was an issue with that particular tenant, you could uh, you could go well. You know what? That's got a great office component to it, great warehouse component. It's well built. It'd be easy to replace that tenant, particularly at that type of rental. Mm. Yeah. So the rent on that was 82 a square meter, which is about 30 percent below what it should be in that market yeah. so we we cop the in our opinion a, a lower yield for that market but there's 30 percent upside as soon as that tenant goes or there's mm -hmm. a market review so it's an absolute no-brainer at 1.2 million um yeah they, they're there's ups like significant upside once that's sorted and imagine rentals are pretty tight up there as well so they're just going to have to stay where they are right so yeah. they have to just but yeah they're and they're not the building as no well. they're not they're there not might building. be there might be a scope and i hope there's a scope even in the 12 years that i've been doing it i don't i feel like the rents haven't really changed that much but um i hope that if if we're not able to replace the stock because of the cost of construction and um even with lending being quite tight if we don't replenish that stock and there's not new stock built you would hope that that then has an effect on the rental rates, which it would, would be need good. To, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's the um, that's the expectation. So, and um, so that's the Townsville market, uh, Dan. You probably say all similar things for for Toowoomba. What's the? It's a long, long way from Townsville. <coughs> How's the markets differ? Oh, look, we're we're probably very similar metrics around what's you know the the movers and the, the reasons. Obviously, the market shifting. Um, the Toowoomba market's probably a little bit different. Well, I'm probably a little bit biased too, mind you. Uh, I think it's the best regional market in Queensland, if not Australia. <laughs> you're meant to. You're meant to say that. If you don't say that, you're not going to be very good at your job. Uh, but look, Toowoomba's got lots of things happening, and I think that's you know that's one of the things. To be honest, I actually feel a lot of people outside the Toowoomba market know more about what's happening in the Toowoomba market than some of the locals. Um, you know, the diversity of the economy. You know, obviously, Toowoomba's you know backgrounds agriculture. You know, it's obviously you know it's the head of the capital of Darling Downs essentially it's you know a lot of people will retire into Toowoomba as opposed to going into Brisbane so that big catchment area of western Queensland you know out as far as Roma you know the, the Charleville sort of corridor you know all seem to sort of you know, gravitate towards Toowoomba so agriculture is probably one of the biggest drivers there but off the side of that obviously in the last you know few years and making resurgences around that gas and oil and gas sector you know out through as far as Roma and so on in that area that has a positive influence um, the infrastructure projects in and around Toowoomba has been massive over the last few years. On the second range crossing um, inland rail is going to be a significant change for us as well as far as the Toowoomba market is concerned. You know, we've got a strong health you know, uh, field in Toowoomba. So there's a massive amount of positivity around what's happening in Toowoomba, you know, and it's led by private, you know, enterprise, you know, the likes of the Wagner family with their 
you know, airport, you know, privately owned first airport, you know, privately developed airport since World, Tullamarine. World Camp, is that World, World Camp? Camp? Yeah. Uh, first private airport developed since Tullamarine. Mm. Um, you know, there's uh, groups like FKG out there, you know, have got strong, you know, in industrial presence, you know, Interlink SQ. I mean, there's a, an intermodal hub there dealing on the existing Western Rail Line, which we get connectivity into the port of Brisbane. So there's a massive amount happening out in that area. Um, and, and it's going to have a, a really positive influence on the balance of the market and, and price point is probably one of the things that's a contributing factor particularly around that industrial space in actually attracting tenants so you know it's um it's one of those things at the current time you know with everything that's happening particularly in that southeast queensland corner brisbane market particularly i think that's really an opportunity for toowoomba you know to take that next step and go to the next level yeah. and, and this is investors priced out of brizzy or investors seeking other assets and or businesses looking to capitalize on a surging local economy to base themselves out of Toowoomba. Well, it's probably all of the above, yeah. to be honest. I mean, you know, business, you know, we were talking about industrial land prices before we came in here. And well, you know, land prices hitting sort of seven, eight hundred dollars a square meter Brisbane market, well, you know, comparable price point in Toowoomba's hundred and twenty dollars a square meter for developed bench land ready to, okay. to an industrial space. Now that's the that's the largest stuff out of you know the the, the well camp air hub uh, the, the hub. Um so I mean that's 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 a point of difference, you know, and, and add in all the amenity that Toowoomba's provides and the livability and the lifestyle. You know, that's, I think, one of the bigger factors that's you know, attracting you know, people to the Toowoomba market from a business point of view. Mm. And I think the flip side of that, you know, that the, all those elements gives investors massive amount of confidence in the region. You know, when there's the amount of money being spent, particularly from a private point of view in that Toowoomba area, it, it underpins, you know, the, the, the stability of the market. You know, for, I hate sort of referring back to you know things like the GFC, but you now the GFC, you know, for Toowoomba wasn't as significant as it was a lot of other markets, and I think it's a big part of that is because we don't have a lot of the big institutional yeah. owners. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have the big players in town that have you know heavily leveraged off assets in, in Toowoomba. It's, it's private wealthies, it's private organisation that underpins the Toowoomba market, and I think that's that's one of its greatest strengths. You know, providing stability, it's potentially you know a negative element of things too, in that you know it's it's you know probably a um, you know, a, a market which probably isn't as proactive and progressive as other areas because of that localization. But we've got some great businesses there. You know, we mentioned those before, like the likes of FKG and Wagners, particularly. You know, with what they're doing in the Toowoomba market. Um, you know, to go and essentially spec an airport, you know, and build it in 19 months. You know, it's now an international, you know, airport. You know, we have flights. You know, uh, primarily around freight. There's no passenger movements internationally, but. They ship freight internationally on a weekly basis out of Toowoomba. Yeah. Well, a lot of people still, don't realise You're still that. striking distance to Brizzy, right? You know, and well, look, I, I drove down from Brisbane this morning to, I took to, to Brisbane this morning to get the flight down. And it's, you know, hour and a half, hour, 40 minutes, and you, yeah. you're on a plane. But we've also got the connectivity of the local airport too, which a lot of people are attracted to. Mm. You know, you know on, pick the right day and you can fly direct out of, you know, out of Toowoomba into to Melbourne, Sydney, Townsville, across the pond now. Mm -hmm. Like the connectivity of the Toowoomba market and the livability actually is something that you know, is, is advancing its next I, level. I, well. I have never been to Toowoomba. And well, you should. I, I think I'm going to have to get there. And I've never been north of um, Bundaberg either. So Wash your mouth out. Bill. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, and I, and I, two I, two and very I, good I markets. I call myself a proud yeah. Australian. So yeah. I think myself and Scott are going to have to get on the road because, you know, it's, it's all academic to me, right? But, but to the point, well, if I'm a commercial property investor, it should just be academic, right? Like, you know, I'd, I'd like to actually immerse myself in these markets, get a feel for it, because you can tell the stories around it, you know, and you look at Toowoomba and you look at Townsville, you, you talk about Toowoomba and the investment going into it, this sort of, these local area dynamics, which is driven by private enterprise, which is mm. supporting stuff, complemented or supplemented with with major um, infrastructure work, like in uh, inland rail. Mm. And then you look at Townsville when, and just today they've just, um, uh, they've just announced the big defence strategic review, and they said they're going to be prioritising development of of northern northern um, uh, cities, which is supporting of, of the defence ecosystem, which yeah. is which is brilliant. It's yeah. brilliant for for Townsville. So it means yeah. that he's going to start getting you're going to start getting more government money into it, attracting people into it, developing the defence force, which creates everything connected with it. How much does this matter when you're assessing these locations, Scott? So imagine it's pretty important right like long-term yeah. economic growth because commercial property is connected with yeah so growth. one of the great things about my job is i get to see all the different rental markets for like for like assets mm. across the country and and we got active in both these markets back in 2018 so that's ahead of the you know when things started going and and my main reason was the rents were cheap so let's just talk industrial like that were 80 dollars a square meter for, for sheds and um brisbane was like 120 and um 
you know, you're just getting larger assets for the same money. It just made sense. And we we're buying way below replacement costs because the GFC um, just, I think they just stopped building a lot of the stuff uh, uh, because it wasn't economically viable. And yeah, basically the existing stock was just priced well. And, um, and the yields were like, Sean brought a good point up. Like we were seeing value in the yields that the locals weren't because they're still stuck at two years ago looking at their comparable sales, a bit like we would in Sydney going, oh, that's what the price was. And you, you get fixated on trying to replicate last year's deal, but they don't know what's coming from mm. the ripple effect. Mm. We do. We're actually causing the ripple effect in some markets and then that goes into the next market. And that, like that value identity is, is really what, um, what got us into those markets. It was just cheap from a leasing point of view and a buying point of view and, uh, and the yields made sense. So, and then you look at the overall economy because you don't want to buy in a one horse town, you know, mm. if that's backed by, you know, one mine. That's not, that's not going to be a don't fun Don't do game. that. If no. there's one thing in commercial property, don't do that. No, no. but Toowoomba no. and Townsville and, and many of the other larger cities up there, like it's, it, we love things backed by agriculture, yeah. love things backed by defense. You know, that's not going anywhere. Mm. Defense is going to grow massively. Right? Large yeah. ports, large hospitals, universities yep. and all that sort of stuff. And they're not tourist towns these as well. So like we're not as big in camps, for example, um, yeah. because it's they tourist, really struggle over yeah. COVID. You know, the vacancies yeah. up there, like most assets, if there's got 10 tenancies in it's you know, three will be vacant that's a good case you know like towns where you're, you're getting nine or ten out of ten in terms of you know when you buy it it's fully occupied um mm. toowoomba's it's probably even stronger it's I'd say. yeah yeah, so. yeah. And, and with toowoomba dan um do you sort of extrapolate out from toowoomba do you look at the sunshine coast and, and brizzy is that your your realm as well look we've got a sunshine coast office okay. um nick down in the sunshine coast runs that that team down there I look, to, to give you some commentary around, I suppose, our market and some of those markets in the surrounding, I mean, we're probably, you know, we've, we've seen, I think, you know, the likes of Scott's team have seen value in Toowoomba, obviously, you know, in softer yields as well, but we've maintained some yield, um, you know, from even with interest rate rises. So, I mean, if a good quality asset in Toowoomba is probably in that, you know, mid six range, probably similar to that Townsville market. Um, you know, if you look further, further west, I mean, as you go out towards that Roma, Chinchilla, you know, Dolby sort of market, you know, heading out, um, you're going to probably see better value, but probably you know higher level of risk to, to obviously offset that that value too on a yield barley. Uh, Sunshine Coast actually talking to Nick earlier today. Um, look, they're seeing you know still some tight yields down there, industrial yields in the sort of mid to lower five percent yield range still. So, and they're you know good blue chip, you know, um, you know good sorry um, you know, standard industrial assets, but nothing sort of too too expensive either. So that sub five six million dollar yeah. price point. So. Yeah, but we look. We've got a fair coverage. I mean, you know, between you know the the partner offices with Colliers and and the, our Brisbane and Gold Coast offices, you know, we do cover a fair part of Queensland. You know, if we we don't, we know people who, who can. So. so what's like a being a an, an agent in Toowoomba? Like you 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 racking up K's on your car, driving out to Roma and Chinchilla and all those sort of places. Look, to be honest, Phil, we don't probably you know venture too far out into that market unless it's you know it's a specific asset or it's a tenant tenant driven requirement. Okay. Um, or a really good owner. Or a really, like, really good owner. Yeah, owner. look, a relationships. I mean. Mm. You know, Sean touched on this before. You know, we're we're in a market that's strongly relationship driven. Mm -hmm. You know, that's you know from a buyer and seller point of view. Um, you know, it's it's like as Sean said before, you can be you know, talking business with someone and you can be you know seeing them at the school you know rugby event on the, on the weekend. So, you know, Tom is a small place. Yeah. Um, you know, reputation is important. You know, and obviously, you know, that's that's part of what, you know, where the business stability comes from. So, look, I mean, you know, doing business in Toowoomba, it's um. You know, as I said, it's, it's relationship driven. Um, you know, there's, there's lots of good opportunities, and you can leverage those relationships to get the best deals for for people you deal with. So. And and um, Sean, do you get outside of Townsville very often? You sort of get not, to Mackay. Not really. No, like um, we we deal with the other partner offices a little bit. So mm. we've done a little bit in Cairns over the years with those guys, but we try to not step on other people's toes to some extent. So if there's a, a deal or a really good client that we deal with in Cairns, um, we'll generally just get on the phone of the guys in Cairns yeah. and say, hey. That's like four hours. You know, I've, got, I've got to keep putting yeah. it back, back yeah. in the context for me. Like yeah, yeah. four hours from Sydney. So yeah, well, I, it's almost it's a yeah, it's yeah. completely yeah. different market. You know? Well, I just, uh, you know, listening to uh, Dan talk about his, you know, driving from Brisbane, one of those places close to us is Charters Towers. It's 135 yeah. k's west. That's, you know, a good hour, 20 minutes. I've just recently done a deal out there or I'm hoping to, if Lucy listens to this, she should go unconditional soon. But um, 
that's that purely just came through an existing relationship, you know, and it was that was just a family thing where they were friends with mum and dad. They were out there. They maybe were a tad frustrated with the agent's ability to do something out there. So it would be the first property I've sold out there, but mm. only because there was a demand or an existing relationship. We said, well, look, we'll come out and give you a hand, and it's worked out reasonably well. But you don't. Yeah, it's pretty it's, hard. It's got to be the right asset. That's you know, right. We certainly operate in a broad market. Yeah. You know, but, you know, it's got to be a, a good quality asset that we know is either saleable or leaseable. Yeah. And yeah. and if I had to summarise this discussion and, and the common thread through everything is is relationships, right? Mm. You know, it, it is a, it's a people-driven business. Yes, the, the numbers and the fundamentals and asset is key, but to actually get a deal done, a deal done is a, a commercial transaction. Um, it's imperative. Like you guys are good operators. You're, you're the best in your game in your respective markets. But... It comes back to relationships, you know, and I imagine there's a lot of slash and burn merchants out there who just never get an eye or get a look in just because you just don't want to deal with Yeah, Phil, I've got those people probably yeah. have a short lifespan. Yeah, they're yeah, probably not tuning into this though, you know. Yeah. yeah. Well, we've got a blacklist of uh, agents that you'll never go near. It's, um, Do you actually have a blacklist? Oh, yeah, yeah it's slash. because they, they rush a sale. Mm. Uh, and like Sean mentioned before, like, you got to really check the numbers when you present a deal. Um, due diligence on an agent side's almost the so, key. So, so, this point, do you think it's your job to catch out an agent not putting together real numbers? Or well, I imagine these are blacklist aware. people. So right? yes, yeah. So it's yeah. all on us always. If yeah. we miss something or the buyer, like it's buyer beware. That's the whole point of this. That's why you got to due diligence. But yeah. uh, a good agent, and all the big branded ones are good. Uh, it's more like your risk when you get a resi guy, you know, try to swoop over and do something and he doesn't know how to like factor in like land tax and, you know, maintenance allowances and stuff like that. Or they um, don't disclose the tenant hasn't been paid. We had one last week. Um, it hasn't, there was a tenant not paying for the last nine months and I, they would have known that, mm -hmm. but they just simply put it in front of our nose. We hadn't dealt with them much before, hoping we'd miss but it. But they must know that you'll find out. Maybe they didn't. Maybe they're just hoping. But Phil, often hope. they're only thinking about that one deal. That's yeah. the problem. They're only thinking about that one deal and they think, well, if that particular property is worth $2 million, bucks, they're only thinking about the commission on that one deal. They're not That's thinking it. about what happens in six months or 12 months' time. Mm. That's the so, problem. so good agents then largely package up the properties appropriately and what you get given is largely what the real story is. Yeah, within like two to three percent there's okay. a little bit of variance it's like if you've got a shopping complex and there's 10 tenants like you know the insurance might be out of date and little things like that and and then there's no malice there's no nefarious very rare. reason for doing it it's yeah. just it's just never not current so and John's yes. the only reason that might happen is if a particular owner has just given you old information yeah. it's not quite up to date that's generally where it comes so, but you guys to. must vet it though like when you get information because you again it's back to your reputation what yeah. you, well, you've got you to put out there you got to vet it and you know the flip side of this is you know obviously the due diligence that the buyers do you know from our point of view we've got a you know nothing frustrates a buyer more than having partial information because mm -hmm. unless it's there complete to start with and you're still waiting for information to come through you know that just frustrates people. You must have alarm like, bells where you go, no, nah, I don't want to be well, selling this property to this person. Well, a lot of the time you'll actually be, you want, you'll hold off going to market until you get all the information mm -hmm. because you know very well you've put in front of a good, credible buyer that's ready to go and you haven't got all the information in hand. They'll get frustrated. They'll they'll go on to the next deal that's mm -hmm. you know ready to go, that's more thorough around what the information they're getting and you're just doing yourself an injustice. So, you know, we've, we've said quite often to, to sellers, let's hold off, let's make sure we've got all the information ready to go because, you know, when we, when we go to market, we want complete information. So it's, it's, integrity, right. it's all about integrity, integrity in the deal, integrity in the numbers, integrity in the buyer, integrity in the seller, integrity in the agent. Yep. Uh, it sounds so easy. Well, yeah, I, like <laughs> to, yeah. I like to use the expression, I think it's my boss's expression, but you can kill a, uh, you can shear a sheep a hundred times, you can only kill it once, mm. you know, and that's a bit of a classic with commercial real estate, you know, you might go it's in thinking- Queensland, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's I very think North that's, Queensland. It's probably, yeah. probably, a, probably a Tassie one, actually. We don't have many sheep up in North <laughs> Queensland, but, um, you know, you just don't, you can't go doing a deal or you might do one deal and if you just piss off that particular owner, whatever, you'll never see them again. You'll never do that deal again. You'll never deal with that tenant again. And you've cost, you might've made money in that particular deal, yeah. but you don't know what the future cost is. You're not going to have longevity. Yeah. So, yeah. so, put, so put a Scott aside for a moment, because Scott represents buyers. Just say if you're, you're trying to do this yourself, right? And you're going, okay, I really like the idea of Toowoomba Rural Towns where I want to start getting to know the agents and that sort of stuff. Where do you start? You just call one of you guys up and go, hey, I'm an investor. I'm ready to buy it. What do you got? Is that pretty much the extent That's of That's where most people's discussion starts. Yeah. Yeah, but, but, not, not nine times out of ten, probably internet based. They'll be flipping through after hours, you know, watching a bit of TV, flipping through you know, some of those platforms and 
shooting off a few inquiries. That's where a lot of the, the inquiries yeah. start. I think to they, they narrow their search. They say, okay, well, if I'm looking for an investment property and my budget's between the classic, to be truthful, is the 500 to a million dollars. Yeah. We get a lot of those phone calls. I don't know how many I've had over the years, but be hundreds. Yeah, I'm looking for a commercial investment property under a million dollars and uh, at 8% net return. I was like, well, she's... I thought, I thought it was Tell me where they yeah, are. Yeah, I, I like, thought it was said, 10%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, well, I'll, I can put you, add you to the list. It's a very long list and it's impossible to get that particular asset. But um, that's generally how they start. They might search for it and then all of a sudden they not they don't find any. Yeah. Or there's that one property that might meet certain parameters and then when they call you off it, um, there's generally reasons why it might be in that parameter because it's yeah mostly vacant or whatever so you're you're looking for a different type of buyer so there must be people who finally give you a call and go i'm sick of this i've been looking for ages i never get the properties that they want i hear they they exist but i can never get a hold of one you know again trying to get some you know off-market stuff is the best stuff right look I, yes there would be a few of those more of our clients come from i think we've created the market a lot of it like mm. educated people about commercial property because there's this stat out um which i'm quoting a bit at the moment because i saw it on the abs there's 550 odd thousand residential transactions per year commercials about twenty thousand. you know it was you know 17 16 and then last year there was a bit more so call it twenty thousand per year sales imagine if that residential market knows that you know, like and they, they they're cottoning on to the returns are better the capital growth is actually better over the last 30 years too you know that's an amazing stat it, it, even though commercial probably be fairs a bit bit on the nose these days for some people they're highly leveraged right they're, they're, they're hurting as much as resi people yeah and well, we've look, covered this off yeah but they're yeah. lower debt then they've got high, like the you st most people are still covering their interest twice over like you've got to forget these guys aren't 80 percent leveraged they're like yeah. 50 or less so um more people are coming into this market. So they hear the podcast, you know, we've got books. They, you know, people are getting forced out of residential because their broker said they can't do any more. So accountants say maybe look at a commercial, there's better tax de deduction. So like the numbers and all that, it's pretty easy to get people to look at commercial once they know what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and when I first started my company, like no one had a clue about res uh, commercial. Like this is just mums and dads. So, mm -hmm. um, this is back in 2014. Like I remember trying to show a industrial shed to someone and, you know, you get laughed out of the room, you know, but now the, the market is more educated. So mm. they mention our buyers are more educated. So that's, I think, Definitely. because they've listened to this stuff. Yeah. Well, we're doing yeah. good, mate. Maybe yeah. there's a, you know, there's an award there for you. <laughs> but I don't, <laughs> service for services for, uh, you, you, for you, property related you're education. You're discounting that he's not getting rewarded by his clients already. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, so what did you say? 20,000 commercial sales. How many resi? Five, 550. 550. Yeah, right. on average. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So imagine my theory is like, imagine if 100,000 of those guys, and they won't. But imagine if a hundred of them start looking at commercial. Yeah, that's just five x the, the market. The stock's just not there, from what I understand. No. So and you know, particularly that lower price point stuff yeah. that Sean was talking yeah. about before, that five hundred a million or even you know, slightly higher than that. That's the most competitive sector of the market by mm. far, and probably where the, yeah. the yields have remained fairly tight because of the competition, supply yeah. and demand. Yeah, and you know, we were chatting earlier. There's there's commercial place going up all over. Everywhere I look, there's another greenfield commercial site, sort of. Going up or industrial site going up, and I and I said this is going wow, it's a lot of properties coming market, but it sounds universally that stock is really tight, Scott. Like it's tight to get good stock. There's probably a lot of duds around. You probably buy yourself a strata office somewhere in any place, fifty kilometers out of the capital city. I, but, yeah. I think it's one thing I was thinking of earlier. Um, a lot of people want everything to be, even in commercial in you know, investment, they want it to be easy. And sometimes if you're trying to get something under a million bucks. You can't expect it to be easy. So there's opportunity there, but buyers have got to be smart enough to say, okay, this could be a good little investment property, could be a good little commercial property. At the moment, it's 50% vacant, but it's in a good area. It's a bit run down. It's this. So there's opportunity for those people if they're willing to put in the work, um, but that's an education process in itself. So people, mm. instead, they'll go, you know what? That's too hard. I don't want to tell my friends oh, I've got to bloody go and paint this joint and do this to this joint. That's mm. not real glamorous. I'll just go and buy a house that's ready to but go. But it's glamorous in in residential investing because the idea is that you want to find something which Fix is which is like a hundred grand below where the rest of it is. You spend twenty grand giving a lick of paint and some carpet and some new lighting, and it's up like you know there's there's a certain I don't know if glamour is the right thing. There's a certain um there's a certain strategy which a lot of residential property investors go at. So maybe the same's in. You know, tarting up old uh, commercial stock, Scott. Well, same yeah. same as what Scott was saying before, though that five hundred fifty thousand residential 
buyers versus 20,000 commercial, it's the same with tenants. Mm. There's that same disparity. So there's a lot of people out there that need to rent a house. Mm. There's less people out there that want to get an office or workshop or whatever. So that makes the market tougher. Well, maybe there's something we can pick up uh, moving forward. Have you got any questions around that? If you're doing that, let us know. But um, big part of what to, to what Scott was saying earlier, um, you know, there, there's a lot more people interested in commercial property just – happens to align with the fact that we launched this podcast so maybe the timing is just uh serendipitous but um uh you know on that note i think we've done a lot to expand people's views and observation towards commercial property uh as an asset class to invest in you know this catalyst or this realization that at a point in time those resi investors when they get a big enough portfolio will get sick enough of that big enough portfolio that they'll start eyeing uh commercials part of their strategy it might be to, to start preparing for a you know, um, uh, a different sort of strategic future for their portfolio. So, you know, new gents coming all the way far down from from Townsville to Wimber. Uh, thanks for doing that. It's great you could make that trip to to share your views and and go deep into these particular markets. Um, uh, and and yes, they do have their own dynamics and different drivers, different economic drivers, and the way people sort of operate within them. But the universally, the the the, the principles are, are the same, right? You know, um. Uh, good transactional behaviours to, to get a deal done, but but the inherent value of the asset is still key. So um, it should sell itself, really, if you've got good stuff, Scott. Yeah, and like that's why when people say, oh, the market's going to fall, like you've often said, oh, the returns are worse in commercial. Mm. You know, they're, they're not going to drop in value because of that demand. There's hundreds and hundreds of buyers for every property that's existing, especially in the cheaper price points. So the demand will prop up the prices and once interest rates settle down or drop you know it will go to new heights and when the rents are growing that's why i'm uh quite bullish like i always said on this podcast i'm not a forever property bull like i'll be the one saying yeah it's not time to buy when it's not time to buy and i think that time will be when rents drop you know yeah. if the economy hits let's say there's a war or there's a another bloody uh um, let's not say that covid type thing if rents will start falling 20 30 percent that's that's when you don't buy. You sit on the sidelines, pay your debts down, just bunk it down. But every single market we're looking at has upside in rents. Yeah. And the ones that are less, uh, we're less bullish about is like the office market because there's more vacancies and stuff like that. So that's a market I'm saying don't buy. You know, this is not advice, of course, but this is just my thoughts as an investor, an active one. Um, but these regional markets in Queensland, they're, they're rock solid. There's not enough supply. There's you know the demand from tenants is is creeping up as well in all asset classes and um yeah it's it's just finding the stock if uh if we could find more of it that would be my dream so putting on the spot toowoomba or townsville where would you buy look the yields are a little better in oh look i ha i see Ooh. less good deals in toowoomba there's just like dan mentioned and I've, i hadn't heard that analogy before the privates they seem to control that market so mm. it's harder for someone like myself to get in there and get a good deal um, because they're all just holding it blindly forever. And so the transaction volume seemed to be very low there. For a big city, you know, 120, 30 odd thousand people, there's there's not many good deals. So I'd want more of them. Um, so do I. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I'll, you know, say sticking up for Dan a little bit, but they're both good markets. I guess that's the biggest thing. Both Townsville and Toowoomba are both good markets, both got opportunities. And where, you know, both Dan and I are on the ground in those areas and we're pretty keen to look after investors and put the right deals in front of them because we're, you know, both our attitude is there about long-term, not short-term. So mm. we try and make sure that any investment deals we put in front of people are good quality deals that we'd be willing to buy ourselves. I think there's massive upside in both these markets. You know, mm. something we didn't touch on, but, you know, those construction costs are really where yeah. you know, what's going to be a dictating factor, some of this increase. And in, we'll, in need to wait around, we'll need to wait around a little bit until... You know, that's ameliorated and, and construction yeah. be, can begin again. And it will happen. Yeah. It will happen. Um, uh, but there's sort of wider sort of economic challenges we're facing. But um, now, Jen's super informative. Thanks for some of the secret sauce. You've given a lot away, which is good. Uh, uh, no doubt a lot of people just be sitting there going, this sounds a lot harder than what I thought it is. But, uh, uh, you know, keep at it. Keep um, keep focused. Scott, I'm sure you can help them out. What can they do if they want to be yarn to you? Just uh, just info at rethinkinvesting.com. Um or Google Rethink Investing and yeah, leverage off our contacts like these guys. Like we we work hard to get access to agents of this quality and mm. they have good quality stock. So when we know like they're gonna get a property they could sell fifty times over when it comes up. So my job as a buyer's agent is to be considered for that. Uh you know, because yeah, they could sell it without us. Um 
and we want it off market so we don't have to bid against 20 others that's also uh, not favorable so we would okay. yeah I hope, you took, I, I hope you took these guys out for a nice lunch or something. Or other. It sounds like you're dating at the moment. But, uh, <laughs> think of me, think of me. But yeah. um, oh, look, great insights. But that's that's reality how it works. You wouldn't need to be looking for every advantage you can if you want to get the best assets. So uh, keep tuning into this podcast, uh, Inside Commercial Property. Thanks for joining us. Uh, remember, please keep those reviews coming wherever you tune into it. Um, myself and Scott, um, it's great to see that uh, what we're doing in terms of uh, helping educate you around property is resonating and you're actually taking – uh, impact and uh, uh, and action on that, uh, and the team also really appreciate that feedback as well. So keep those reviews coming, Scott. We'd sort of do a Q and A episode. We'll do that soon. There's lots of questions coming in. Uh, the biggest problem you're going to have is that you're probably going to get bombarded by people saying, "Can you find me a million dollar property at eight percent in Toowoomba <laughs> or or Townsville? Or Hurry up, please, or anywhere else in Australia." So uh, good luck with that. You let us know how that goes. Uh, that's inside commercial property. We'll see you again next time. Until then, bye bye. Thanks.